Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast supported by Pragati, a flagship media initiative of the Takshashila Institution. We're a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru, and we like to bring a fresh perspective to Indian affairs and an Indian perspective to global affairs. So grab a cup of coffee, sit back, and join us for today's chat. Hello and welcome to another episode of All Things Policy. I'm your host, Shri Krishna Upadhyaya. And my guest today on the show is Manoj Keval Ramani, our China expert. Manoj and I are going to be talking about the great power competition playing out in the world today, specifically with respect to the Indo-Pacific. So last week, we had organized a conference in our office on the theme of understanding the post-pandemic world order. And Manoj had written a paper, which is also available on our website, and I'll be linking it to the show notes, where he writes about the great power competition that is playing out. Today, I'll be asking him a few questions about his perspective on the issue. And to begin with, let's look back at the last few years, right? And we have had the COVID-19 pandemic and we have had the Russia-Ukraine war, two very major events which have had a very disproportionate impact on the world order. We have also witnessed the slowdown in the globalization. And there is the increased uh, security threats that the countries in the world are perceiving today. And also at the same time, multilateral institutions have weakened. So Manoj, my first question to you is, how have these developments and others in the last uh, few years impacted the way that you're looking at the post-pandemic world order? Hi, Shri. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having me. Look, to the question as to how these developments have impacted the post-pandemic world order, I think the word that most people use nowadays is, you know, there's a sense of disorder, there's a sense of uh, uncertainty, there's a sense of uh, volatility. Uh, and that's how usually, you know, we're looking at what's happening in the world. There's a tremendous degree of uh, unpredictability and a lot of uh, hectic activity. Uh, the traditional rules of the game that existed, not just, uh, you know, pre the pandemic, but since the Cold War ended, that sort of structure has seemingly now decisively ended. We don't necessarily have one major pole or a unipolar world. We have very different poles of power and there's a lot of jostling going on between each of them. Some of the fundamental rules of uh, international relations, some of the fundamental norms of international relations, such as uh, respect for territorial integrity and sovereignty of states, seem to be breaking down. Our you know, trading dispute resolution mechanisms uh, have become stagnant. They are unable to address the kind of challenges that we are facing. And that's because the dispersion of power among countries has shifted quite significantly. Along with that, domestic politics in the West in particular has become far more sharp with this rise of populism, this rising trend of nationalism, you know, some degree of isolationism, uh, which say, you know, Brexit was an example of it. The Trump administration's policies were an example of it. But not just Trump. I mean, even if you look at the Biden administration, while it has engaged much more purposefully in the world with its partners and allies and with multilateral institutions, uh, there are strands of this sort of thought of, you know, that the U.S. needs to be essentially taking care of itself first. Uh, and you see that around the world, right? You see these concepts of uh, self-reliance, Atmanirbharta, becoming commonplace when it comes to economic engagement. The idea of economic globalization being significant is sort of receding. People are talking about resilience in supply chains, not just because of you know natural sort of issues that may take place or natural disruptions that may take place, but also because of geopolitical risk. So essentially, we're in a place where in a very different order than what we were used to. And there is tremendous volatility, which is leading to you know, decisions being taken to adapt to whatever a new sort of framing that we're seeing emerging. And I mean, I do have a framework of what I think is emerging and what I think we're already living in and what it engenders is this volatility. So this volatility is not a, at least in my mind, it's not a periodic thing after which we will see stability in order in the future. I think this volatility for the foreseeable future is something that we have to live with because this is inbuilt into the kind of order that we are seeing emerging. Right. And before we speak about the state of fluidity or volatility, as you put it, I know you also believe that we are already in a multipolar world. Uh, but the fact is that there is a great power competition that is taking place between the United States on one side and the China on the other side. Right. So there are these two taller poles in this multipolar world which are competing against each other today but at the same time due to the processes of globalization and trade over the last 40 years they are also deeply integrated with each other in many respects our economy being one of them so where exactly are these two countries these two great powers today competing and at what points are they cooperating with each other 
And I also have a second part question to this, which is that, you know, a lot of people are comparing this with the Cold War situation, which existed after the World War II had ended between our Soviet Union and the US on the other side. But you believe that is wrong. You believe that you cannot call this a new Cold War. So I would like to hear more on these two aspects. Yeah, let me begin with the second part first. You know, whether this is a new Cold War. Look, I mean, you can call it a new Cold War and you can give it whatever characteristics you want to to define it as a Cold War. Fair enough. Uh, But essentially, when you are doing that, you are basically making a case for that it is something akin to what we have experienced in the past, which was the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union. So you are harking back to a framework which exist in the past. Now, I'm not saying that there are no similarities at all. There are certain similarities, but in very, very significant ways, the competition that we are seeing between the United States and China today is not like the Cold War that was there between the USSR and the United States. Simply, to firstly, to state that, look, these are both countries which, you know, because of decades of economic globalization are deeply interlinked, right? Today, China-US bilateral trade is at nearly $700 billion at a record high, whereas the trade between the Soviet Union and the United States was nearly non-existent. Uh, so there is this deep sort of intermingling in the economies of the two countries in terms of their innovation ecosystems, which I think is inescapable, right? And which makes confrontation of the kind that we saw during the Cold War, very, very difficult, right? In that sense, I think economic globalization over the past three decades has actually done its job. It has made major power confrontation and conflict all the more difficult. In the past, during the time of the Cold War, you know, the one sort of key factor underpinning, you know, sort of mitigating conflict between the US and the Soviet Union was the fact that there was mutually assured destruction. Today, because of economic globalization, it's not just mutually assured destruction at a nuclear weapon level and, you know, in terms of weapons of mass destruction, but it's also economic, which makes this sort of competition that we are seeing today much, much more complex. And therefore, the tools that you will bring to the table in this particular competition will be very different. Secondly, one of the features of the US and Soviet Union's, uh, you know, Uh, Cold War was that there was a clear ideological division between the two sides and both sides were essentially trying to shape a world order within its sort of ideological context, right? So there was a certain revolutionary zeal on both sides, right? There was a competition between systems of capitalism and communism. Today, we don't necessarily see this, right? Both sides there wanted to sort of reshape a new international order, although they did work together at the UN Security Council. But here, what we're seeing today is that both sides don't necessarily desire revolutionary change. They both desire some degree of division in the international order. In fact, to some degree, if you were to say it is the United States which has been somewhat revolutionary under the Trump administration when it pulled out of key institutions. China is not doing that. China is basically saying we want a bigger stake in the international order and we want to shape instruments of the international system to our benefit. Part, so it's a much more sort of, I don't want to use the word insidious, but I can't think of a better word, right? It's sort of much more insidious, right? You're trying to do it in a much more surreptitious manner where you're engaging your participation and you're sort of changing the structure of what is there from within rather than wanting to replace it. Uh, and that change is also not holistic. You know, you're not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. What you're doing is that you're trying to sort of make incremental changes that suit your interests. So human rights is one example, right? China is not saying that it does not adhere to whatever is the agreed to human rights protocol. It's saying that let's expand the definition of human rights. And, you know, because there is a particularity, you have to take into consideration national conditions. Therefore, you can't apply sort of a universal prism. And also who defines what exactly is the ideal state of human rights? The West cannot be preaching us and look at the West's violations of human rights. So it's very different from you know, what it was in the past. And even if my argument is that even if, say, some would argue that there is elements of revolutionary zeal on both sides. And if you read enough Chinese language commentaries and papers, you will see that there are elements of that. If you watch American politics, you will see that there is an element of that. Even if that exists, both sides are limited by their own resources, their capacities, their domestic politics, and their global appeal in trying to craft this new sort of world order. So that's the second point as to why I think this is not the Cold War of the past. And finally, It is not the colder of the past because neither side has the kind of capacity that the US and Soviet Union had back then, right? You have these tremendous middle states that we are seeing today, middle powers. And for most people who sort of then get into 
descriptions about technical descriptions about what exactly is a middle power now in my definition is sort of very broad which is that uh, i look at g20 countries except china and the united states and these are all your sort of middle powers there is a huge difference in their capacities and power levels but they each have significant stakes in regions that they are and even beyond and they are much more active there is a greater degree of adventurism from them their ability to strike bargains and sort of limit the cost that they have in these bargains when they are dealing with both of these major powers is far greater than what we have seen in the past uh, during the previous cold war so therefore there is this clear sort of well, i don't want again want to use a third pole idea but there's this clear sort of set of diffuse actors who can shape the direction of uh, the world order and in terms of the ukraine war we've sort of seen that right there is a distinct position that countries in the developing world have taken and they differ they differ from each other also but it's not sort of fallen in line with each any of the major powers right so for all those reasons i don't think this is a cold war now where do china and the united states compete i mean to me right now their competition is holistic it's across the board it's in all dimensions uh, but most sharply in terms of emerging technologies um that's where we are seeing the sharpest levels of competition in terms of where do they uh, cooperate at present there is absolutely uh, very little cooperation that's taking place both sides are struggling to arrive at some degree of stability to even talk to each other um in november you started to see some degree of movement towards regularized dialogue again which had broken down in august last year when nancy pelosi visited taiwan and the chinese overreacted to it so from november after xi jinping and uh, President Biden met in Bali there was this process of stabilization that began there were meetings amongst officials at different levels there were talks between say US Secretary of Defense and the Chinese Defense Minister and US uh, Secretary of State Antony Blinken was expected to visit China in the first week of February to essentially kick start another round of dialogue and conversation but all of that was blown up with the balloon and so far what we've seen since that balloon controversy is that neither side is i mean the united states has actually reached out and they've actually tried to talk and the chinese have basically said we are not interested at the sidelines of the munich security conference last week there was a meeting between antony blinken and senior chinese diplomat wang yi that meeting didn't seemingly break any ice if the readouts from both sides are to be believed and what you see right now is essentially from the chinese side is a lot of vitriol because the americans have gone ahead and shared details of what they see as this massive espionage program using balloons that the chinese were engaged in with 40 countries and other countries have raised the issue with beijing too and uh, most notably the japanese foreign minister specifically raised the issue with the chinese foreign with wang yi when they met in munich which i think has irked beijing a lot so i think we are some way away from cooperation and stabilization but there are many areas where they can cooperate from say health pandemics climate change possibly on issues like afghanistan and terrorism um, so there are areas where they can cooperate but essentially the idea is that these two great powers need to be talking to each other so that you don't accidentally or you know get into conflict or sleep walk into conflict right on the use of the cold war paradigm to explain the current situation today one of the things which you wrote which really struck me was the fact that our uh, thinking of today's world in terms of the cold war lulls us into a sense of complacency because uh, we think the conclusions are foregone right we think the international liberal uh, order backed by free trade is going to reemerge much like it did uh, 30 years ago when the cold war ended but uh, in fact in reality there is no such guarantee because the competition between us and china can pan out in very unpredictable ways having said that i think i wanted to double click on the question of conflict on the fact that you mentioned that in your uh, paper you write that you know today the probability of direct great power conflict is higher than ever since cold war and this is despite the fact that there have been a tremendous surge towards globalization of course the russia ukraine war is a big setback to that force but apart from this uh, why do you think that there is a higher probability of direct great power conflict between the two countries yeah i mean if you in the paper i make these points but if you look at what exactly is going on between china and the united states the first is like i've already talked about that they're struggling to find mechanisms for direct communication the fact that after this balloon controversy the us secretary of defense reached out to beijing and his call was publicly snubbed with beijing saying that look you need to set the right atmosphere for talks i mean that doesn't sort of give you the sense of confidence that both sides will be able to deal maturely with a crisis when it erupts right particularly from beijing's point of view i mean when's a good time to talk if a crisis is not a good time to talk so i think that that sort of gives you a sense of that sort of erodes some degree of confidence in the ability but there are some structural reasons right i mean the russia ukraine conflict is 
the starting point, right? I mean, to me, that conflict coming particularly after that February 4th, 2022 joint statement between Putin and Xi Jinping, which drew parallels between what was happening in Eastern Europe uh, with NATO's expansion uh, and the US's Indo-Pacific strategy and, you know, and subsequently Chinese narrative around how, you know, this is essentially an American proxy war being uh, played out in Ukraine, where America is trying to essentially constrain Russia and expand its hegemony and so on and so forth. And it sees parallels, Beijing sees parallels between that and what's happening in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, to me, that's your first red flag, right? That it tells you that uh, Beijing feels that it's under far more threat and it is uh, therefore going to be prepared, uh, you know. Uh, and also the fact that that statement that I mentioned, the joint statement, it refers to, you know, China and Russia both needing to sort of intervene in their near abroad, in their regions, uh, to their periphery, to maintain their interests, which, again, does not bode well for stability in the Indo-Pacific region, particularly for China's neighbors. Uh, and we've seen, obviously, uh, actions taken, say, with regard to India, which uh, reinforce that idea. The second point is that, uh, you know, if you look at uh, what uh, is happening within the Indo-Pacific region in itself, you know, there has been a fundamental reorientation of American force posture in the region, right? And this has been incremental, but it's taken place quite purposefully. You know, in June 2019, uh, the U.S. Department of Defense's uh, Indo-Pacific Strategy Report talked about having, quote, combat credible forces who are, that are forward postured in the region. And since then, there have been steps taken to achieve this. Uh, in the, the 2023 uh, National Defense Authorization Act includes specific provisions for deterring Chinese aggression and supporting Taiwan, which is becoming a flashpoint. One part of this is to review American logistics and basing operations in the region uh, so that to ensure that, uh, and I quote, American forces are ready to fight and have the tools that they need to fight. So the force posture is basically changing, right? And there have been reports uh, with American commanders, say, based in Japan, who are talking about having more agile forces, uh, you know, drilling with the Japanese uh, to be able to counter any sort of uh, threats of force from China. So I think that is important to note, right? Another thing is that you're seeing, you know, the US has actually succeeded in getting more end partners to support its operations. So for example, very recently, you had, uh, you know, uh, the US secure four additional military bases, access to four additional military bases in the Philippines. This had been long been pending from an American perspective, and it's Chinese policies which have incentivized these countries to actually take these actions. If you look at Chinese behavior, you will see much more assertive behavior, right, in the region. For example, in the last couple of weeks, there's been tensions between China and the Philippines because of the use of military-grade lasers by Chinese Coast Guard vessels to target Philippine Coast Guard vessels. So there is an upping of the ante, right? And there is a much more hardening of lines with regard to what is acceptable. And there is shrinking dialogue which can contain these tensions. Now, one key flashpoint that could lead to conflict is obviously the Taiwan situation. The Chinese have become far more assertive on the issue of Taiwan and they've sort of made it very clear that it is a red line that must not be crossed and it is a sort of fundamental core element of their engagement with the United States, which the United States must maintain. Whereas the United States has reaffirmed its one-China policy, but it has expanded its uh, support to Taiwan militarily, diplomatically, and in every other way that it can. So this is a flashpoint which is going to sustain. Next year, we are going to see an election in Taiwan. If you see a far more pro-independence leaning government that comes into place, then that is right now there. If you see a government which say, or if you see political uh, adventurists who end up, say, calling for a referendum or something like that, you can see tensions escalate uh, and potentially you can see conflict. Although that conflict, I think everybody understands is in nobody's interest. Even Beijing understands that it's not in its interest. Uh, but you are seeing that progressively some of these previously adhered to red lines uh, have been crossed. Like in August, China, when Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan, um, China did sort of cross certain red lines. It fired missiles over Taiwan's uh, airspace. It blockaded Taiwan, essentially. So you're seeing some of those traditional, you know, self-imposed boundaries being crossed, which makes it much more dangerous. Finally, you know, like I said, economic globalization over the past three decades created the interdependencies which led to, you know, which has constrained the possibility of conflict between major powers. But as we see that, you know, this talk of decoupling in all takes intensifies, and if we see economies decouple even further, so far, like I said, we're seeing some degree of decoupling and some degree of splintering when it comes to emerging technologies and high technology, but not broad-based. But if we see that taking place, 
then what happens is that the threads that sort of bind these major powers together weaken and therefore once those weaken the incentive and the or the cost of conflict goes down in some ways or at least some type of conflict goes down so therefore the probability of conflict has increased much more i'm not saying that any of this means that conflict is imminent i'm just saying that the probability say from 5 years ago to today has increased much more and the likelihood of that probability continuing to increase is greater than what we have noticed in the past right and the probability that this conflict is actually going to play out in the indo pacific is also gone up as what i would believe but thanks manush let's take a short break now and we'll come back with more Welcome back to All Things Policy. We're in conversation with Manoj on the great power competition happening in the world today. Uh, so, towards the end of your previous response, Manoj, you spoke about how the fact that globalization has reduced is increasing the probability of conflict today. You know, I was just scrolling through the Twitter feed of uh, President Joe Biden a couple of days back, and the chatter is only about manufacturing in America, bringing jobs back to America, or uh, decoupling of. Uh, friend shoring near shoring and so on so a lot of people a lot of analysts have called this a trend towards deglobalization and america which is supposedly the champion of free international trade and uh, economics has taken a couple of steps back and is looking inward today but you sort of disagree with this analysis i believe you think that deglobalization as such is not happening but there are some other forces at play so would you like to explain your position on this manoj yeah sure so i don't necessarily think I mean again some of the challenges with these terms of deglobalization or decoupling is what do you define as deglobalization so the way i see it you know is if you go back to sort of first principles why do companies and individuals make decisions on economic matters usually you look make decisions based on economic parameters and rational thought right what is in my best interest which has the lowest cost and gives me maximum efficiency and things like that and when it comes to international trade essentially corporations and companies have made decisions based on uh, comparative advantages and therefore uh, capital has flown from one area to the other uh, and goods have flown back and all of that what i think is happening is that yes geopolitical fictions are spilling over into uh, into economic decision making there is far more recognition today that uh, uh, among corporations and countries that geopolitics is going to matter much more to economic decision making and you can't just simply make decisions based on economic parameters however this is not necessarily manifesting in say splitting of supply chains and breaking of chains all around you know uh, data will show you that you know from 2008 onwards there has been a dip in terms of global trade as a percentage of global gdp so if that is a metric to assess deglobalization yes in that sense deglobalization has taken place but it's been happening since 2008 it's not a phenomenon that's happened you know right now or because of the pandemic or because of china us competition if you go back to 2008 2009 actually china us relationships was fairly strong right beijing had been working with the united states to deal with the fallout of the global financial crisis so it depends on how you define this trend my view is that if you are simply looking at deglobalization or reduction of you know companies investing in what are seen as rival countries geopolitical rival countries then that's so far not really happening right what we are seeing is that there is a certain degree of weaponization of economic dependence which is evident in say what china does with bananas with the philippines or with uh, what china does with imposing tariffs or not -tar using non tariff barriers with regard to australian goods or say what india has done with regard to blocking uh, chinese apps what india has done with regard to chinese investments and blocking them or trade with china what the united states has done with regard to huawei and others so there is a certain weaponization of economic interdependence there is a certain uh, return to industrial policy which is when say president biden says that you know construction materials that are used will be made in america the chips act was passed in america the inflation reduction act which all of which subsidize american companies and the use and call for the use of american products and boosting american manufacturing likewise in india we've seen this narrative of atmanirbharta in the us in, in europe there is this green industrial deal that has now been cleared in china there is this idea of self reliance uh, and the use of industrial policy so across the board you are seeing industrial policy 
becoming the go-to tool for a large number of sectors, right? And that's true. That's happening. And the third thing is that there is an emergence of a splintered technological ecosystem. So when it comes to emerging technologies and critical technologies, you're seeing some degree of splintering that's taking place. And this is happening not necessarily entirely in national boundaries. It is maybe happening with groups. So the Quad is an example of this, right? Where you're talking about emerging technologies within a particular group. And those groups are likely to be built on basis of trust and political trust. So that is how I would describe the sort of future of globalization going forward, that you will see these trends playing out. Because at the same time, you are seeing, say, India-China trade at record highs, at about 125, $127 billion. You are seeing US-China trade at record highs. So it's not deglobalization as a whole. So in a nutshell, I think it depends on what you define as deglobalization and you can make the case for that but if you look at the broad picture i don't think deglobalization understood as you know a breaking of chains and a breaking down of trade between countries is really taking place also finally in terms of investments say in china if you look at data from amcham shanghai if you look at the data from the european chamber of commerce in china if you look at data from japan's jetro what they are telling you is that companies are not exiting china because they fear geopolitical risk you know very few are most companies expressed anxieties in surveys over the last two three years with regard to china's covid policies because they felt that the way that was handled it was eroding you know policy predictability reliability and efficiency and that i think can be a long-term concern also they were worried about disruptions you know, once the disruptions were caused, it made them realize that they needed to have resilience in supply chains. So you divert some investment somewhere else. But that does not mean that you're exiting China. In fact, if you read news reports, a lot of Western companies have not even exited Russia. So it's not that companies are simply looking at geopolitical risk and saying, OK, it's a done deal. We need to exit. That's not really happening. What they are doing is that... Uh, they are looking at that. They are trying to build resilience, but they are not exiting markets. They may be reconsidering future investments, but current investments are not necessarily going out. But yes, the politics around the world, in countries around the world, is impinging on these decisions much more. So we might see that impact going down the road in the future, in the years to come. But I don't think it will be as holistic as a breakdown of the system that we are thinking about, you know, that, that the word deglobalization sort of talks about. Sure. Actually, uh, now let's uh, move on from economics to foreign policy and diplomacy and I have a question to you on uh, the aspect of middle powers that you mentioned earlier on in this conversation. Uh, so you say that everybody in the G20 other than the US and China can be termed as a middle power today. And in this great power competition in a multipolar world, the middle powers are jostling for advantage. And you have written that, you know, this is a good opportunity for the middle powers to engage in strategic deal making with the great powers being US and China. Uh, so how much leverage do you think these uh, middle powers enjoy today? Uh, how long is it going to last? And uh, finally, what do you think India should be doing in this so, point of time? Yeah, so this is probably the most difficult thing to answer in terms of how, how long do I think some of this will last. Uh, look, at present, uh, like I said, because we are still in somewhat of a state of flux and both countries are jostling for influence, we are seeing far more, uh, you know, opportunities for middle powers. I don't think this moment will last forever. Uh, I think these are usually short windows and those windows close very quickly if you don't act. And if you act to strike deals, you can actually expand your capacity and your power and your relevance to great powers. And therefore, uh, you further b sustain multipolarity rather than result in some degree of bipolarity. So let's say, for example, right now, if you're seeing... Uh, you know, India's engagement with the United States, there are far more opportunities than we've seen in the past. You know, that new agreement on critical and emerging technologies that was, uh, you know, agreed upon between India and the US during uh, NSA Ajit Doval's visit to the US uh, is an example of that. You know, these are kinds of things which would not otherwise be high on priority, but they're being fast-tracked talks about, you know, semiconductor related invest, uh, investments, talks about the US, you know, GE's investment in aero engines in India. Those kinds of things were traditional sort of challenges, which today are being overcome with greater ease. It's not like they are easy and they happen immediately, but there's a greater ease in which uh, those decisions are being made. Likewise, if you see the Indo-Pacific economic framework for prosperity, which the US has proposed, there is a reason why that framework and that you know, the four pillars of that Indo-Pacific economic framework engender flexibility. You can pick and choose which pillar you want to be part of and you can help shape the narrative, help shape the structures of rules 
going forward. And India therefore has chosen to be part of three of the pillars while exiting the trade pillar. This degree of flexibility being offered by great powers is an example of the fact that middle powers today have far greater bargaining capacity. Now, how long this will sustain? I mean, it's anybody's guess, right? It depends on the way in which both these great powers engage. If you see sharper confrontation, if you see a black swan event, if you see hostilities, whether in South China Sea, Taiwan or somewhere else, then the room for this, you know, bargaining and sort of wriggling through becomes far, far limited. I mean, take the example of the Russia-Ukraine war. It, the pressure that India has faced to choose sides when it comes to the war over the last year is indicative of this, right? That there is tremendous pressure, uh, sometimes publicly, sometimes not publicly, for India to be much more clear in its preference when it came to that war. And therefore, to make certain decisions, say, whether it's about importing Russian energy, whether it's about, you know, what you're exporting to Russia and things like that. Now, imagine if this is China involved in conflict with the United States, whether it's in some sort of third party conflict. It just reduces the scope for what India can do because the United States will simply say, look, this is in your interest. You must act now. You can't prevaricate on this now. And there's no middle path in this. So it makes it much more difficult for India to bargain for things. So therefore, I think the window depends on the nature of the US-China relationship. A certain degree of contained hostility might be beneficial for countries like India. Uh, it might not be beneficial for countries like South Korea, perhaps, but it will be beneficial for a country like India. Or say, uh, you know, India's interest will be very different from Singapore's interest or how Singapore views uh, hostility between the US and China. But it is in nobody's interest to see that hostility escalate into conflict. Because if that happens, then your windows collapse. Um, until it is contained to a certain degree, you have room for maneuver, you have room for bargaining. And, you know, if you do that well, you cultivate enough capacity and power that you sustain multipolarity. If you don't do that well, then you risk falling into a bipolar order down the road. Right. Uh, and like they say, we are definitely living in interesting times. Thank you once again, Manoj, for joining me on this conversation today. And for our listeners, Manoj's paper is linked to the show notes. Please do read. Tell us what you think of it. Write to us on social media as to where would you like to place your bets. Thanks for listening. In. If you liked our show, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can tune into them on the IVM podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts. You can also follow IVM on social media. The handle is at IVM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And hey, if you'd like to dive into Takshashila's research on technology, strategy and economic affairs, check us out at our Twitter handle at takshashilainst or our website takshashila.org.in.